Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at vafb.com. everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce all of the wonderful local products we enjoy. Brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. A Culpeper County farmer is literally building a bridge to help fellow farmers in the Midwest. It's sweet corn season and Chef John Maxwell shares a classic recipe with us. And many farmers are taking extra steps to keep your local produce safe. Welcome back to Real Virginia, everyone. We're coming to you from the Agroberry Farm and CSA in Hanover County, and we're going to check in with them and some of their raspberries later on in the show. But first, we're going to go to the Midwest, where historic rains this spring have washed out plenty of rural roads and devastated corn and soybean crops. One Virginia farmer and his friends have found a way to help their Nebraska farm neighbors. Burke Muller has this report. Much of Nebraska is underwater from immense rainfall in the spring of 2019. Farmers across the nation have tried to help. Some have given money. Some have provided other resources like food and shelter. Jesse Wise is giving a bridge. Back in March, I seen so many people in Nebraska that were suffering so bad in the floods. And uh, there were people everywhere in the country sending them hay and things. And, we didn't really have a whole lot of hay to see and we were short on hay so I got to thinking what would help and uh, I had this bridge and... In addition to being a farmer, Wise owns a scrap metal business with his wife. A customer gave him a surplus temporary bridge and Wise knew where it could be put to good use. Wise contacted officials at the Virginia Farm Bureau who put him in touch with their counterparts in Nebraska. The Nebraska Farm Bureau had set up a donation website to help their farmers and had received donations from across the country. One eight-year-old boy, Kai Baldwin, raised nearly $300 in his Utah community and sent the donation to the Nebraska Relief Fund. Folks at the Nebraska Farm Bureau recognized that Jesse and Kai, though decades apart in age, were linked together in spirit. Jesse spoke with two other Virginia business owners he knows well and soon plans were made to send the bridge to a new home in Nebraska. Pete Reed drove the truck, donating his time and equipment. Perfect story of people helping people. Reed had helped deliver goods to folks in the Carolinas and Florida after last year's devastating hurricane season. It was a real turning point in my life, uh, just seeing how grateful and appreciative those folks in the Carolinas were just to receive. It was just the little things that really made a big difference. The bridge is 45 feet long and weighs 22 tons. Jason Neff of Neff Crane in Culpeper donated his equipment and labor to get the bridge's 10 pieces onto Reed's flatbed truck. He was happy to help. Especially something like this where it's something that people couldn't, couldn't help. Uh, this was mother nature, so um, this was out of their hands. Once the bridge was loaded, it was off for the two-day trip to Nebraska. The journey wasn't always easy. Keith and I left yesterday morning about 9 a.m. and battled tornadoes and wind. Uh, we had to hunker down in a rest area in Wayne County, Indiana for about, what, an hour yesterday? Yeah, about an hour. Um, then on I-80 and you know, in Iowa, uh, the wind blew four tractor trailers over. So it's been kind of an interesting 30 or so odd hours. But the bridge made it intact to its destination, Cedar County, Nebraska, where 32 bridges were destroyed this spring. Officials here haven't decided yet how best to make use of the bridge. We'll make a spot. We'll find a place where we can use it. We might have to fabricate it, make it wider. We might make it, we might make two bridges out of it. Who knows? But we'll find a place for this material. So far, the Nebraska Farm Bureau Disaster Relief Fund has brought in $2.5 million, with 100% of the funds going to farmers. With the bridge, money, and other donations, at least farmers in Nebraska now know there are empathetic Americans out there trying to help. People who who don't know who they're helping but 
know and understand that there are people that need help that have reached out to provide help in some way. Meanwhile, a Virginia farmer and his friends can feel confident they made a difference. In Culpeper County, Virginia, I'm Burke Moeller reporting. Farmers with extra hay often donated to producers in drought areas, and that's just one of hundreds of formal and informal efforts to take place in rural America each year. Federal disaster aid programs and crop insurance help some producers, but there's never enough when natural disasters hit. Neighbors often pitch in to help a family plant or harvest their crops when the principal farmer is laid up or has passed away. And organizations like the Farm Bureau and commodity groups often create fundraising programs to assist natural disaster victims. If there's one thing you can count on in rural America, it's your farmer neighbor. I'm Mark Fiat. Coming up on In a Garden, I'm going to talk about some methods that you can use to enhance your container plantings. Stay with us. Farm Bureau is the insurance provider of choice for farmers. But did you know all Virginians can benefit? In fact, most of our members are not farmers. Members may take advantage of discounts on selected autos, trucks, mowers, and tractors on top of the many insurance offerings. Your $40 membership will easily pay for itself with their many savings options as well. Farm Bureau is made for Virginians. To learn more about the membership advantage, go to VAFB.com or visit your local Farm Bureau. You're going to need me. You're going to need all of us. You're going to need the next generation of leaders to face the challenges the future will bring. And we promise we'll be there when you need us. I have fond memories of helping my grandmother hang container plants on her front porch. And Mark Viette says that summer container plant projects are easy and fun in the garden. Many of us have container plantings. You know, it might be hanging baskets, it might be larger containers like this, or smaller containers out on your patio or deck. What do you do with them? Well, lots of us plant annuals. Well, really, they're tropical plants that in our climate freeze and may not come back year after year. One of the things that I have found that's fantastic to add to planters are summer flowering amaryllis, just like this. This is what it looks like. You plant it in your planter when you plant your little plants, and depending on where they're grown, many of them will bloom with three stems and four flowers each. These are grown by my friend Blue Maker, and they are produced in a way to create a big bulb. In fact, there's another flower coming up here. It's just another way to add color to your container plantings. The summer blooming amaryllis bloom for four, six weeks, maybe even longer. But the advantage is when they finish flowering, they have beautiful foliage for the rest of the season. And if you have some old flowers, you just come through and you can just remove some of the old flowers and you can come in and remove some of the old stems and you got the great foliage. One of the things we do with these planters, I'm a firm believer in mixed colors. You know, all the colors of the rainbow that pick up from one another really enhance your container gardening. Consider making your outdoor containers permanent. Now we usually do this with larger containers, concrete containers that don't freeze and crack during the winter time, but we put in perennials. In fact, we didn't have to buy these perennials. We went out in the garden, dug a hosta, out in the garden, and dug a beautiful daily, and we combined the two together. You can even have hosta in ferns, and even combine a hosta or ferns and annuals in the same container, but you leave them outdoors, saves a lot of money. Just think about all the different types of hardy hosta that you have. Now hosta, some will grow in full sun, but most of them like bright shade. And you can see the variety and size of the leaves. They're beautiful. And you can even combine three different hostas in a container. But then we have the golds, which are nice. Then the dwarf little blues or the variegated forms. 
and then you have the giant leaved hosta. Some people even incorporate conifers or dwarf conifers in these same plantings. Again, just leave them outdoors. They have to be big enough and they'll survive through the winter and you can enjoy them year after year without having to replant them. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. Chef John Maxwell shows us how to enjoy Virginia corn in a bowl instead of on the cob next, in the heart of the home. And now, a sneak peek into a day in the life of a Virginia dairy cow. They get their day started. They have some lunch. Get some exercise. Spend time with their friends and then end their day with dairy sweet dreams. Real dairy, real life, real delicious. Bye-bye. Hi. Hoping for a crisp breeze to help keep you alert. Oh, oh, he took a sip of water too. That'll probably help. You were probably gonna turn down the radio too so you could focus, right? Probably okay isn't okay. Right? If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. I think the water line is what really drove it home. I blew on them. Virginia sweet corn is a delicious treat any time of the year, but you don't have to wait until summertime to enjoy it. Chef John Maxwell shares a classic recipe for corn pudding in the heart of the home. Hi, and welcome to the heart of the home. We're here at Doswell, Virginia at Meadow Hall in Meadow Event Park, where every week we get a chance to play with some great Virginia food. I'm Chef John Maxwell, and today we're gonna to be playing with some beautiful Virginia corn and making a corn pudding that's just to die for. Right, first thing we're gonna do right, is mix our batter. Right, and I've got uh, six eggs. I've got some flour mixed with baking powder, salt, and sugar. All right, and I'm going to mix this together all right, with the six eggs and two cups of cream. All right. All right. All right. I want to make sure that it's the right consistency. All right, it's beginning to look good. Now I think I can take the rest of the cream. All right. Okay, now this is the batter. And this can sit for a minute or two. And I've got a skillet here. I'm getting hot on the burner. Hear that? When the pan starts singing, it's ready to cook. Right, so in we go with some onions. This is a mix of onions and shallots. Shallots, just a smaller, nuttier flavored onion. Uh, it just adds a little, little more character. It's kind of hard to detect in the corn pudding, but it's, uh, it's a good flavor. And once this gets rolling, I'm gonna add this corn. Then you can use fresh, which is what we're doing in season. I blanched it and took it off the cob. But you can make this in the wintertime as well. You could probably use frozen corn for that. I wouldn't suggest canned products because there's a little too much salt in those. All right. So let's let that roll for a couple of minutes. Get those two little rascals back in there. Ah, there's another compatriot. It's going to take a couple of minutes to, to finish cooking. All right, this corn is about ready. I've got my batter. I'm going to add the corn to the batter. And that's in there, along with the onions and shallots. Mix this up good. I'm going to add a little bit of thyme. And and that melted butter that we had. Get 
this all stirred up nice. It'll mix a little bit as it moves around under the heat in the oven, but I like to get it fully mixed before I put it in there. Okay, so that looks pretty good here. Bring my pan over. We're not going to try and unpan this. We're going to serve it straight out of this casserole dish, so I don't have to worry too much about buttering the sides to keep it from sticking. And I like that nice little crust that builds up on the outside. So, all right. In it goes. Yeah, get every last bit of it in there. And we're ready to go in the oven. And there it is. All oh, beautifully done. Ah, very nice. I'm going to get a plate. All right, it's nice. It's not sticking. It's got a nice little crust there. Don't think that. This really isn't a difficult procedure. All right. But it's a delightful product. All right, it's corn pudding. Some beautiful Virginia corn, eggs, and cream from our great dairy industry. This is a Virginia pudding. We're going to call it a corn pudding. For, uh, for, for today. So join us next week on Heart of the Home, where we get to play with great Virginia food. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at VAFB.com, as well as on Chef Maxwell's website at ChefJohnMaxwell.com. Sweet corn's raised on 416 farms covering 4,369 acres in Virginia. The majority of that delicious corn is sold directly to the public through farmers markets, CSAs, or even a few pick-your-own operations. About 50 producers raise enough sweet corn to sell it for processing. 2019 is shaping up to be a good year for sweet corn. Abundant rain in the spring meant there's plenty of moisture for the crop. Most sweet corn is planted early, so it ripens by early summer. But a few producers delay planting so they can have fresh sweet corn as late as September or October. Hey Bobo, do trees tell each other stories? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, why don't we go find out? Listen. Do clouds take naps? I couldn't tell you. Dad, do stars visit their friends? Look! We have 37 parks across the Commonwealth. Every year, 10 million visitors enjoy 600 miles of trails from beaches to mountains, hundreds of cabins and campsites, even yurts. We are Virginia State Parks. Virginia farms are bursting with fresh fruits and vegetables every summer. Dave Miller reports some farmers are taking extra steps this year to assure that their produce is safe for consumers. Fresh vegetables, melons, potatoes, tree fruits, and berries account for $188.7 million in sales for Virginia's farm economy each year. The great majority of those sales are for the fresh market. Lois's produce has been selling at farmers markets, grocery stores, and restaurants in the Washington, D.C. metro area since the late 1980s. A lot of the produce that you see comes fresh off the fields every day. There's always someone out there picking all the new vegetables and bringing them in. And then we do have our cooler in the back, so anything that we have excess of goes in the cooler and comes out during the day and pretty much they are fresh that day. We start out in the spring with uh, asparagus, uh, strawberries, and then soon after that there's English peas and there's beets and there's all of those root crops and, and then you get the squash starts coming in, the string beans, we've been picking string beans for oh, about three weeks now. Uh, then we move on, Soon it's going to be 
watermelons, cantaloupes, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, uh, and, and we plant more than once so it lasts over the full season. You, you got to have something for the whole season. You can't plant one crop and expect to cover the whole season. Uh, these tomatoes we'll pick for about three weeks, so I'm going to have three separate plantings of tomatoes uh, to get us through the season. In 2016, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration updated food safety rules for producers who sell directly to the public or to grocery chains. For several years, those guidelines were voluntary under the Good Agricultural Practices Program. Now they are mandatory. The produce safety program controls how fruits and vegetables are harvested, packed, and stored. Any U.S. produce farm with annual sales of $500,000 or more must follow these regulations, and many other smaller producers are also following them in their daily operations. It essentially just puts into practice good food safety rules. Um, things like washing your hands uh, after you eat and before you handle any produce, um, having water accessible so that your uh, workforce is safe, um, as well as scouting the field to make sure that any wildlife damage or wildlife um, potential vectors for disease are being correctly handled. Um, if we find you know, an issue in the field that could cause a problem with folks, we quarantine that, we get it cleaned up, and we don't go back to harvesting until it's really clean and safe for folks. Pearson Geyer is field supervisor for Agriberry Farms and CSA in Hanover County. They hire young workers to do much of their harvesting and take special pains to train them in safe food handling techniques. They are careful to document who's trained for mandatory inspections by the State Department of Agriculture. They watch a video that makes sure they understand that when they're sick, they shouldn't be out in the fields harvesting. When they're um, coming into work, they want to be washing their hands and be clean and ready to go, um, and generally be um, cleanly as well so that they're not bringing a lot of dirt and um, uh, germs into the workplace. So everybody goes through, through food safety training that gets logged, and then when VDAX or a GAP auditor comes by, we can demonstrate to them that we've done this training with all of our staff. The federal standards were developed in response to a series of national food safety scares involving fresh produce a few years ago. One key tool to preventing contamination is clean water. Agriberry Farm uses only tested well water in their irrigation systems. Pearson says preventing contamination is the first and most important step, and it's worth it to him and his family. The safety of our consumers is incredibly important, and if it takes a little bit of extra work on our part to make sure that every one of our consumers is safe, we are happy to do that. We want to make sure that people are confident in their local agriculture and keep supporting local agriculture, and keeping them safe and nutritious is an important part of that. While these are federal food safety standards, they are administered by the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services in a cooperative federal-state agreement. Virginia farmers prefer working with local staff and regulators who are more familiar with their operations. Producers who sell less than $500,000 a year are currently exempt from the regulations but must still be registered with the state. To learn more about the food safety law, visit VDAC's website at vdax.virginia.gov slash food produce safety. In Westmoreland County, Virginia, I'm Dave Miller. We're so glad you could join us to celebrate all the bounty that Virginia has to offer. From your kitchen to your garden to our wide open spaces, we're proud to say that this is real Virginia. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching and make it a great week. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart, oh.